Ladies and gentlemen, for the next instalment of the 24-hour global business show, Quantum Leap, uh, giving ideas and inspiration to small business owners throughout the world, it's my pleasure to have the next guest on the show, Rory Lawson. L Rory, welcome to the show. Thanks, John. It's great to be part of it. Thanks for having me. Rory, uh, for those that are, aren't into their rugby or perhaps not from the UK, some of our USA visitors that think rugby players are mental because they don't have any uh, any sort of protection on. As an international rugby player, 31 caps and uh, also captain of Scotland, what, what makes a great leader, Rory, both on the field and off it? How long have you got, John? This is a, that's, there's, a, there's a long answer to that, but I think, um, you look, I, it, my rugby days were a, f a few years ago now, um, and, but they were great days. And I think I think what, what makes a great leader carries both from sport and business. And I think that's why I've ended up doing what I do now um, is because I've, I've got a real passion for it. Um, but it's a passion for people. I think when you, when you combine people, process, progress, um, that's the really important thing for me, um, no matter what the environment. And I think as an elite sports player, um, you need to be self-obsessed individually for the most part, because even though it's a team sport, you have to understand how you get the best out, out of yourself. And then you can direct your energy to the, the goals of the, the team. Um, so I think as a, as a leader in a team, it's understanding the different parts, components of the team, um, the, the different ways that people see the world and the different things that are important to them and try to pull all of that together. Uh, but one thing that I have to say is, you know, when, when it comes to sport, um, winning and feeling the success as a team and also, you know, failures, losses as a team, when you know that you're in a team that is together, it's, there's no better feeling in the world. Yeah. And uh, what about, and it's a little bit like employing staff, Rory, uh, getting a team together. So some people uh, only respond to a kick in the rear. Other people need the, an arm around them in order to get the best out of them. How, how do you sort of uh, work out who's who? I think you've got to get to know the human being for starters, John. It's something that I think the more that I've worked in this space, you know, explicitly in, in the leadership space, um, the, the wisest and the best leaders who I'm, I'm working with are those who really get to know the people, you know, uh, if, it, if it's just process, if it's just outcome, then you're leaving an awful lot up for grabs and an awful lot of doubt out there. I think if you really get to know the people, the engagement you get, the togetherness you get, the cohesion you get, um, obviously you need, you need that collective purpose. You need to know that everybody's in the same on the same bus and pulling in the same direction. Um, but ultimately, if you can find those commonalities of, of thought, the, what really drives people, what challenges people, um, how you get that commonality throughout the group, the purpose, um, and then, you, then how you build a team and keep a team, then it, people engage and they want, they want uh, what the collective outcomes are. And I think that's that's the kind of holy grail that so many businesses and uh, teams are, are trying to pull towards. It's it's not easy. It takes time because relationships take time. Uh, but I think actually if it's the human being who you're interested in rather than the role that they do or the title that they hold, that you've got significantly higher likelihood of, of um, getting the right outcomes. Okay. So you, you've ended up in a career with uh, uh, working alongside Gavin Hastings and, and Gavin's probably, you know, if he's not the, he's certainly up there as one of the most known Scottish internationals. So what's, what's that like having a fellow uh, person on the same plane as you on, in the same team? Well, look, it's always, it's always a privilege to do anything with the great Gavin Hastings. Um, actually, interestingly, we, we started working with Kianis uh, in, independently at, at first and only during lockdown when we we started having these virtual coffee mornings with all of the associates and advisory board and board and the and the team within Kian it's a small team that expanded quite quickly um did I did I realize that Gavin was was on the same bus as me and um I think we have we have uh, real common interests in leadership and you know Gavin has captain the the British and Irish Lions 
Scotland during an incredibly successful era. Uh, he's a he's a great human being, and it's it, he, he's great fun to be around. So we do different roles within the business, um, but you know, spending time with Gavin, you you cannot fail but leave energized and, and feeling good. And uh, and and he's one of a, a number of fantastic people. I think it's it's the thing that I can say about lockdown and about uh, getting becoming part of Kianis was actually I became part of a team the majority still of whom I've never met but I really th thoroughly enjoy being part of, of this team as a as an uh, executive consultant to the business and I really believe in what the business does and we're seeing some amazing outcomes and and uh, and, and changing leadership behaviors within business and now in sports so it's um it's been a fantastic journey so far. Uh, great answer. And uh, I've, I've always believed that having been a keen sportsman and participant and coach and all sorts of things uh, myself, uh, when I've recruited people throughout the world, I, I've always regarded sports people and uh, uh, elite athletes very highly because of their competitive nature. How does that uh, play out uh, within, have you taken that off the field into the, into the world of business? John, if, with your sports background, I'm sure it, it, it rings true, particularly Australians. I know they're very competitive, any, any that I've come across, but um, I, it's very difficult to shake that out of someone. Um, but, but in many ways, uh, you know, coming to terms with the, the understanding of how other people work uh, and that they may not want to work at the same pace as intensity as I do so it's, it's coming to terms with that and managing that scenario better and I'm just I, I don't think you want everybody within any team or any organization to view the world the same way and operate at the same pace and but it's it's understanding where your your position is within that and it's something that I'm learning a lot but you know as, as I said at the start as a you, you need to have a, a self-focus and drive to succeed in elite sport and that is something that probably increases when you leave sport as well, because certainly in my, in my case, I got injured and I, I knew I had to start in a new world. And if I went into it with any mindset or attitude different to that, of getting better and learning everything that I can, absorbing everything, bringing the, the sort of energy and, and life and vibrancy to whatever environment that I, that I was in, plus, taking the skill set that I developed in, in elite sport, um, then I'm leaving too much in question, I think. And I think that's one thing that I always pride myself on is how I show up, how I present myself, um, how other people might feel when I'm in, the, in, their, in their sort of company. So it's something that I take a lot of pride in. And then I try and absorb as much and uh, understand that if, if, you, if you go into things with the attitude that you know nothing, then you're always going to keep learning and getting better. Yep, yep. So uh, I think we can relate to uh, a lot of that. And uh, uh, well, talking about, uh, you know, you've got a, you've got a bad injury that, uh, that stopped your career. And I've uh, run across in many sports, uh, as well as uh, people that used to be in the defence forces that were used to a very strict uh, regime and... Uh, you know, they had everything planned for them uh, from the diet to the exercise to how you strategized and, and planned and everything like that. And all of a sudden you've stopped being at that elite level and it's welcome to the big wide world. A lot of people, and uh, uh, I'm sure there's some people out there today uh, relate to that in business as well, where, you know, mental health, and it's a, it's a you know, big topic nowadays, particularly with COVID. How do you how, how did, did you suffer from any of the issues in the transition, or what what uh, strategies perhaps did you use to try and uh, deal with leaving that environment and moving into the into the uh, civvy street, as it were? Yeah, John. That I mean, it's even even just when you talk about the some of the challenges faced, it it, it rings so true to me and really clear, really resonates, and it takes me. I, I, I can literally picture myself uh, when you start talking about that, the, the day I, after I was told that my, my career was done and it was literally a, a meeting with a consultant whereby I thought it was a revisit and I thought everything was going to be okay and that things were just going to move forward. But instead he told me that my, his recommendation was that I stop playing with immediate effect or 
um, I could get myself into a bit of trouble with my injury. Um, and I did so, and I took his advice. But the next day, given that professional sport, as you alluded to, is everything, every detail to the minute, um, where you are, what time, what you're going to be doing, what you're expected to be wearing, how long it's going to last, then, you know, you go and you eat and you're, you know, everything's laid on for you and you don't have to think, you just need to turn up and do what you need to do. That's the, the only thought needs to be on how, how do I get the best at myself every single day? And with those structures, you know, it becomes a little bit of uh, comfort and without that comfort, it was a totally different environment. You know, for me, I woke up the day after I was told I couldn't play anymore and I rolled over and I picked up my program printed out on an A4 sheet of paper and I looked at what I was going to do that day. And I, from there, I just, I felt lost because I realized that was, that was no longer my job anymore. That was no longer what I lived for, what I got up for. So I definitely, I definitely suffered. I, I was, I was in a pretty dark place for a while and, you know, being told that your career is over in sport is, is tough to take given that it is such a passion. Um, and then trying to redefine yourself. So the process was quite long. I needed to take some time to, to work things out. I'd done an, an MA in business studies before I'd gone into professional sports and I'd worked for a few businesses um, you know, on a, on a sort of part-time basis, work experience almost to a certain extent to find out what I might be interested in doing. But the, I was no clearer. And so I, I, probably, I probably took three or four months and. I think I had the bones of 100 coffees with different people, um, you know, finding out what do you do? What's your job title? What, what do you actually do on a day-to-day -day basis? What gets you out of bed? What enthuses you about the job? What, what do you hate about it? And just started extracting as much information I, I, I could and then working out whether something might be of interest to me. But my brother, while doing that, my brother's actually an, an entrepreneur and has uh, launched a, a business with a, a few friends and made a real success of it. And while in that process, I, 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 I have a, I had a natural passion and interest in, in food and drink that is good for you. And while traveling around going for all these coffees, I realized that there was, there were only a limited number of options. Um, and so I launched a, a drinks and snacking business with, uh, a friend of mine who had another business in the space and we uh, we ran that for for five and a half years and we were really ahead of the time and in many ways we were bringing you know protein rich snacking and drinks to the to market um and I, I i learned so much i made every mistake there was to make and i met some great people and worked with some great people and again tried bringing a lot of the values and tried building a culture in, in the business that was meaningful to me from sport and did a did quite a good job and really enjoyed doing that but ultimately I, I came to, to an end in the business because I, I lost passion for what it was that you know the product and what what the purpose was and um, and that was when I when I moved into executive and leadership coaching requalifying and, and focusing on that because for me I realized that having had to build a new purpose for myself, um, find a new drive and my, my why my get what's getting me up and, and energizing me on me on a day-to-day -day basis I realized that that's working with and getting the most out of others and I think it was something that I always felt I did on the sports field um, and I felt like I carried into my business and now I want to make it my business to do that so uh, that's that's where I do my, my executive coaching on a one-on-one -on -one basis and then I do my exec consultancy with Kiana Switch is working with teams or individuals with programs and and seeing some phenomenal outcomes, which is which I find hugely satisfying. Yeah, that's uh, that's brilliant. So, what is it with uh, Scotsman and and drinking? Because uh, <laughs> yeah, Shane Warne's got a distillery, and James Watt from Brew Dogs. Uh, well, he's been in the news a little bit lately for yeah. a couple, couple of the wrong reasons, but good PR. Yeah. But, uh, what what is it with you guys up there? Is it the water or something? Well. I suppose it might be the water for for me as, as I guess with um with with Shane's, Shane Warm or James Watt my drinks were at the opposite end of the the scale they were they were good for you they were uh, you know zero fat uh, high protein low calorie 
low sugar uh, juices and snacks. So um, I, 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 it's, it's, it's now a, it's an, an industry that's really sort of booming now and the awareness is greater than it's ever been. And people are, you know, what, what people eat is, and drink is so much more in the conscious of, of a lot of people. Um, yeah. And it, it was actually great to see a large chunk of the, the population using lockdown to, to really take control of how they spend their time with exercise and, and what, what they eat and drink and the impact that it's had. The positive uh, use of time during that period, I think, was, was fantastic for lots of people. Fewer social events, fewer bars open. Um, but yeah, you know, I think it's something I've always been interested in for me. Um, physical health for me has always really helped with my mental health. You know, exercising has always been a great way of me to clear my head and come up with some of my best ideas when I'm either exercising or, or traveling. And that just ties into what, what you eat and drink. And don't get me wrong, I'm all about the balance. I, you know, I, I love a pint and a fish and chips. I live down by the seaside and you get good fish and chips here. So it's, it's all about balance um, and it's, it's not a focus, but it's certainly within my conscious on a, on a day-to-day -day basis. Yep. And uh, we've got a segment, uh, Holly Smith, the new sensation out of Australia. She's, uh, she's doing a segment on that in, uh, in the middle of the show too. So mm -hmm. that'll, that'll be uh, interesting. So uh, Rory, what was, uh, you know, sport, what was your most favorite moment uh, in your sporting career? John, my, my go-to on this answer, you know, my, my, my great memory was captaining Scotland for the first time. And it's, it's not based around glory. It's not really, it, it, yes, it's, it's based around the, the outcome because we beat the world champion Springboks uh, in, in a game that nobody expected us to win. But it was the, I, I mentioned at the start of this conversation, it was the, the collective feel in the changing room that I'll never forget. Uh, after that game and the post-match dinner, you know, spending time with teammates, but the medics, the physios, the coaching staff, the analysts, the, you know, the nutritionists, all, all, the, all these people, the, the, the lawyer, the kit man, all of these people that put in a lot of the hard work to be able to make sure you go out and do a job. It was a, it was a special, it was a special week for me because I'd missed the game against the All Blacks the previous week and the, the, the side had been heavily, heavily beaten by the All Blacks and it was quite a daunting task. So, you know, now, when I look at it with my with my leadership hat on, um, trying to lift, I'm proud of it because it's trying to lift a team who were knocked down pretty, pretty, pretty low by the All Blacks. And a week, a week's a long time in sport, and we managed to to sh turn things around and shift the focus, rebuild the purpose, understand what the key elements that we needed to get right were against the Springboks, captained by Victor Matfield. So you know, standing in the tunnel. You, uh, getting ready to to walk run out alongside the spring box with with my scotland team and looking across the tunnel and seeing six foot nine 18 stone of of south african meat standing on the other side and and staring me down was pretty daunting but um i i had an inner belief that if we if we fought and did the did the the, the things that i believed uh, we needed to do to get the game right we got a good game plan it was a it was a stinker of a day at Murrayfield weather-wise in November and we fought for every inch and um, I think collectively we might have only won by a millimetre but we we won the game 21-17 and it was it was a great day um, and one that I'm incredibly proud of as as as, as so many days and for club and country were. Yep and there's some good lessons there for uh, for businesses never give up mm -hmm. and and doesn't matter how you went the, the week before, you've still got the next week coming forward, which you've got every chance of doing something to change. So Yeah, well, I think you know, this is the standard sporting cliche. You know, you, you, don't, you don't often learn all that much when you win. It's, um, it's you, you know, it's, it's fail, fail and learn. You know, if you do something bad, learn fast, move on. Um, those are, the, those are the, the environments I've been in whereby, um, whereby you've, they've been successful. They've been people doing well. And, um, I, I think the other the other thing is just the the framing of failure and understanding that in sport the best coaches who I was coached by would never criticise a skill error 
if the intent was there, if, if the attitude was there and the energy was there that they expected. And I guess that if you carry that, that into business, if someone is putting the effort and attitude in, then you, 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 can't, you can't knock them because yep. they, just, they might need to learn, they might need to make mistakes to be able to get the best out of themselves. But if everything goes right, you, you, you're rarely learning. I had an hour-long conversation with Dr. Phil Jauncey, who I've known for 40 years, and he was the first guy with envisagement and visualisation and, and to bring it into sport, and he was right on that, uh, right on that subject. So yeah. uh, um, uh, great, uh, great point. So, Rory, um, uh, who's the best player that you've ever played with or uh, against, or that could be in business? What, and what special traits made them that way? Yeah, it, this, it's it's a tough question that one, John. Um, and actually, there were I, I was lucky enough to play with a lot of great players. Um, they all had different attributes in many ways. Um, often, if if I was, if I'm asked to to put together my my all time great fifteen that I've played with, there would be a couple of guys in there who that would shock um, anybody who knew their rugby because. They're not flashy. They weren't the headline grabbers, but actually, without them, the, the those guys who had all the skills and you know the the dancing feet and the the vision and the uh, pizzazz to be able to to be able to make the team tick, they wouldn't have those opportunities. So I, you know, they often referred to as the glue players, the the guys who just do the hard stuff. And there were a number of those guys who who I played with who were outstanding. Um, I think if, if I if I look for a, a name, um, he probably didn't play his, his best rugby alongside me, but that's all relative um, because he, he he just set the world alight in rugby um, alongside uh, John Alomu for the All Blacks, and that was Carlos Spencer, and he was a magician. He had everything that you needed. Um, he had a brain that worked three times quicker than the next quickest brain in the team he saw things that other people didn't see he created opportunities for people um he was he was a maverick and he, he just saw the game in in the northern hemisphere he, he brought a different approach to things in, in the northern hemisphere if you speak to a lot of forwards they see bodies to run into and not space to run into yep uh lossy was always all about the space he was yep. just he, he, would, he would only run at somebody to move them to create space for somebody else. Um, and that's what it was all about. So he was incredible. Um, there was another one of my teammates, James Simpson Daniel, um, who was a, a wing centre at Gloucester. And he was only, he was so unlucky to have a number of injuries at, at poor times or else he could have been gone on to be one of the great England internationals. He, he was about pace, he was about power. He had a standing jump that was just ridiculous um and again it was just he was the go-to guy if you needed to get get the team out of a bit a bit of bother he would be the guy to do it for you turn turn a couple of people inside out have them fall over run through score tries just unbelievable um and then i think finally was just a guy ross rennie who was a back rower again career cut short a little bit but he was a back row guy who just had the mind skill set of a of a back um but physicality that uh, far outweighed his his physical look you know he wasn't a huge man but he would he would be the immovable object if he jackled over the top of the ball he would he would tear the ball away from his opponents um off field he was as soft as a teddy bear on field he was an absolute animal um right. So you can see just all of those different components and, and attributes and characteristics are across the across a number of guys. I could go on all afternoon, yep. John. Um, I was I was really lucky to to play with some some top top players. Yep, and uh, you know I've seen some pretty flashy guys when they get when the going got tough, if they disappear, and some other guys that you that you didn't notice all of a sudden uh, uh, stood up and be counted in uh, yeah. in those sort of circumstances. So uh, some good lessons there for sport and for business. Rory, like a lot of people, just about every single person I've had on the interviews for the last show I did and this one here, uh, particularly those that have had enjoyed some degree of success in business or in, in your case in the sporting field or, or both, um, there's been um, yeah, a commonality and that's give back. 
and just about all of them have uh, some give back thoughts where they like to participate in in that subject. Uh, can you just share some of the some of the stuff that you're involved in and and why is that important to you? Yeah, I, John, I think I think sport in particular uh, is the escape for a lot of people, and they they put a lot of people put sports people on a pedestal uh, because most people grow up playing a sport or loving a sport and would really dream of becoming a professional, you know, doing that for their job. So you end up being in a privileged position. And we look at, you know, the Euros that are on the go at the moment and uh, the Lions tour that's coming up and the cricket and all that kind of stuff. These are, these guys, these guys and women are, are heroes to, to a, a lot of people. And I'm not saying for a minute that I was a, a hero to anybody in, partic in particular, but other than maybe my mum. But, um, but I think for me, when, when you have a profile that people recognise, it's important to try and do something with that. And, you know, so for me, I was, you know, I was, I was privileged to be brought up as the grandson of the voice of rugby, Bill McLaren. And he touched most house households globally who watched rugby for 50 years. And, um, and he was all about giving back. He was about providing a service to people who were tuning in to watch a game of sport that we would entertain, that would inform, that would educate. Um, and since his passing, we set up the Bill McLaren Foundation to try and raise money and carry it forward his legacy, putting, uh, raising money and, and working on a, a grant application uh, scheme whereby people can apply for grants on any sport or anything that can can impact um, the sporting world. So I do I do some work with the foundation. It's been a really tough 18 months, obviously, like it has for so many third sectors. Um, I'm on the, the board for the Barbarians um, Rugby Club, which is something I'm incredibly pri privileged for. And I, it's a it's a voluntary position, but one whereby I'm so proud of that having been a having been a barbarian myself, um, and I, I get involved in in a number of other charity initiatives. You know, one of them through lockdown has been um, the My Name Is Doddy Foundation. Doddy, we are fighting motor neuron disease alongside a couple of other ex professional sports people of profile, and just trying to support what is an amazing cause around that so yeah giving back i i, I do a, quite a lot of stuff with grassroots i try I, um volunteer to mentor a few a few young ambitious sports people um and i try and i try and do my bit with with people in business as well so i think for me it's as i kind of alluded to when it came to the leadership and business work that i do it, it's trying to get the best out of people and that doesn't necessarily have to have a charge attached to it so Yep. Um, yeah, that's that, that's kind of where where my drive comes from. So, so with a with a, probably the most famous commentator of, as a grandfather, uh, a father who played international for Scotland. Were you ever ever going to be anything else other than a Scottish international? I, I could have been anything I wanted to be, uh, John, or certainly as far as my parents or or grand both sets of grandparents, they would have they would have backed me whatever it was. Um, could have been tiddlywinks or, or chess or cross country running or, um, you know, gardening for, for them. It's the, all the, all they wanted is for me to try and find something that really, that I really enjoyed doing. And it's something that I'm so grateful to them for actually, is that through my education, even when rugby was becoming more important, they always kind of continued to encourage me to, to keep up other things. So, you know, education being one thing, you know, I, I finished my degree before I turned professional in rugby. Yep. Um, but I, you know, I love my sport, tennis, golf, cricket, um, anything. I, I will, I will give anything a crack when it comes to sport because that's the environment I grew up in. I was lucky enough to be quite good at playing rugby. And, um, and that was a, a real passion for me that became, um, I suppose a means for, for earning and, um, and, and chasing my dreams. So, it's something that I'm, I'm incredibly uh, privileged to, to have enjoyed, but I don't, I don't necessarily want to be defined by my sporting achievements. You know, now I love my sport as much now as I did when I was probably more actually now than I, when I, um, when I was actually being paid to do it because 
now I do it because I really want to, not because I'm getting paid to do it. And I can stay involved in sport as well with the, my broadcasting commentary and punditry work that I do as well on, on rugby. And it's something, you know, I, I just love, I love sports broadcasting. So um, I, I suppose it's, I guess I'm, I, I'm, I'm proof that if you find something that you're really interested in and passionate about and you go after it, then you, you just never know what you, you might be able to get, where you might be able to get to. Yep. Uh, I, I run across people all the time that uh, that don't like what they're doing and they're not good at it. And I, I just shake my head and think, you know, why why aren't you doing something that you love doing and and that you are good at? Because well, that's that, that 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 final point is the key, John. Is that you know there are lots of things that people love doing that they could never make a living out of. So it can't that can't be your sole thing. You've also got to be good at it. So yep. uh, it's trying to align the two. Yep. So you're now a consultant uh, for Cianis, and uh, which is a global leadership business. How do you guys go about getting new customers? Multiple ways, I suppose. Um, I, so I guess over the past 15 to 16 months through the, the pandemic, the, the ability to have build those sort of organic face-to-face -face natural links that, that would create conversations around you know, where, where, where people's businesses or the businesses people are involved in or, or sporting environments, where leadership challenges, uh, what leadership challenges they might face, those have been more difficult to come by. Um, the world of virtual has become a little bit more transactional as well. So, you know, I, I suppose for me, with, 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 in my experience, it's been about opening some new doors or knocking on some new doors, um, as well as working with with my network and people who I genuinely believe I could could add value to their business and, and strengthen their leadership because if ever you need something to to expose it where there may be a, a gap or two in your business um, a global pandemic is a decent place to start and I think also some of the forward-thinking businesses who realize that it, it's a great opportunity to invest in their people at a time whereby you don't get the the chance to grab a conversation with someone over coffee in the office to ask how things are going and check in with them and it, you know stress areas or whatever it may be actually being willing to say we want it we want to make the most of this time and invest in you so that we we come out the back of this stronger than we've ever been um those those have been great businesses to work with but yeah. the the thing about kianis is that there's nothing that's it's not an off the shelf service that's being offered it's uh the programs are bespoke they're built for the needs of the business they're built for what's already in place in the business where the opportunities lie so it's uh, trying to identify those early on and it's not just a single conversation whereby you know you finish off by saying right we'll, we'll run this program with 10 of your leaders it's in order to create long-term sustainable change there, there has to be an understanding of where the business is now where it wants to go and how we might be able to help so it's um it's something that you know I, I love talking to people i love finding out and trying to to help uh people solve problems and um it's it's been very satisfying th for those people whereby the, the timing is right and that's not everybody yep yep and it's like a lot of things you know the if your timing is right then uh things uh, tend to go better don't they mm, of course yeah rory uh uh, you've got a number of roles at the moment as a pundit, a sports writer and a, a guest. Uh, does that open any doors in and, and have any uh, uh, any connection to business? I'm sure it does. Well, John, we've spoken a little bit about um, the the really strong connections between business and sports. So I suppose the the first thing that that that, that platform allows me to do is is remain relevant in the space and um, and for people who are passionate about my sport, rugby, I, it, it probably nudges a few doors that may, may not be um, capable of unlocking otherwise. But I think it's, it, it, it maybe makes an, a, a first conversation that a little bit easier. But at the same time, it's, I, I, as, I, as I kind of mentioned, the, I, I try to now... You know, uh, I grew a huge passion for sports broadcasting by watching what my papa did. I will never be Bill McLaren. Um, I need to be authentic to myself and try and bring my skill set to things. Um, but when I, when I broadcast, I just try to bring 
the positivity, uh, the mindset, the entertainment, the education uh, that I believe people should do in uh, opinion when it when it when it counts um, to the table when it when when uh, given that that opportunity. But I think uh, and I think it's, it's something that I love talking about. Does it open doors? Yeah, of course it does. Still, because people like sport and rugby, and if they do so, and I can bring a different skill set to a business or an individual, then there's a natural link there, an interest for starters. Yep. Rory, you've uh, become a family man in recent years. And uh, how do you balance uh, home and I guess through COVID as well, you know, work, working a lot more from home instead of perhaps being out and about like you perhaps normally would be? How do you balance all that up, which a lot of people are struggling with, particularly with older kids having you know, education and stuff like that. I hear it all the time that it's hard to do a business and then do all the home life as well. How do you find the balance? Well, I guess the, the easiest, you know, I, I know a lot of people say working from home, sometimes it's living at work. Um, I think it's the, you know, that it, it, it's been a, a huge challenge and there's no, there's no glossing over that. The, you know, whilst I, whilst I really enjoy what I do, I, I, do also like the, the separation between work and, and home life. And I've got a 19 month old boy and uh, my wife India is expecting number two in November. So our hands are only going to get fuller. But I suppose for me, I, I started doing something new just before the, the lockdown. And so it re- if, if anything, is there to focus the mind on on getting things right that was it and i had to try and find opportunity in our restrictive time and make the most of it so i've i've really enjoyed i have to say i've really enjoyed being around to see freddie grow up um, more than i might have been otherwise that's that's been a huge positive when he learned to open doors it became more difficult uh because as has been the case throughout um you know, the, the virtual world and home working, he, he could charge in on any call at any stage. Um, and having that separation, that being accept, being so accessible, being in a, in a, in a room in the house is, has not always been easy. But I guess like with all these things, you've just got to continue to try and get, try and improve whatever it is that you're doing and, um, and do things better and work as a team um within the within the family unit and I'd actually on the whole it's it's going to make these occasions whereby we can get back to traveling a little bit and hopefully have the holy grail of balance whereby a chunk of time can be spent working from home in a space whereby you can work but you're so you, you're taking a huge amount of travel off the table um while also being able to then get out and see people and meet people and deliver face to face which i've loved over the past month or so when when uh, you know the rules are allowed yep uh rory communication is a very big part in whether you employ staff or whether you're uh, with talking with customers or clients or what have you and my favorite referee has to be nigel owens and um can you share anything there as to you know any what what made him a good ref do you think yeah communication was the first thing that you mentioned john um I think uh, I think with Nigel, and, you know, whether whether Nigel would say the same about me, um, I, I, fe- I felt I could build a relationship with with Nigel as a referee, and that was one of respect. Um, but it was also one whereby I I, I th- he would listen to me if I spoke to him in the right tone at the right time and didn't do it too much, and I I knew where I stood with him and that I, I could approach him. And that, that made Nigel different, actually, at a time whereby most referees wouldn't want to talk. They just keep, all they wanted to do is keep you at a distance because that's, I guess, through insecurities or whatever it may be. Um, but Nigel also had an empathy and he had a warmth to him that a lot of referees don't. And again, it's, you know, even when I hear myself talking about this and one of the analytic tools that we, we use um, warmth and competence are, are two key characteristics to, to wise leadership. And Nigel had that and he communicated, he knew when the time was to put his foot down and, and uh, really state his claim and say, you've gone too far now, we've got to get this right. But he was also willing to have fun. 
and I think that's uh, that's something that really came through with him and and set him apart and made him made him the world's best. Yep. Uh, Rory, social media has come under fire recently for providing platforms of hate and keyboard warriors and and what have you. What's your view and? Do you have any thoughts on what we all can do to eliminate some of the garbage that goes on on those sort of platforms? Garbage is um, is the right word for it, undoubtedly. I think uh, I think you know I, I would love to have been in the in the room of Twitter HQ when they were when they were planning what this the, the social media platform was going to stand for on, on day one. Uh, and then see, you know, compare it to, to where things are now. But I think it's it, it, such polar dynamic to it. I think it can be so good. I think being able to give, I, I mentioned the pedestal that some people, and I, I'll just talk in a sporting context at the moment, but it carries right across every industry in the world. The pedestal that sports people are put on by some members of the public, uh, the heroes that are created, and but the access that social media gives the right wider public to these people is unbelievable. And we all, we all follow our, our favorite entertainers who give us something through social media that you would never see if they're on court or on, on the field. Um, and again, this is very much in the sporting context, but it, it's, it carries across the same with actors, with politicians, with business people. It, it gives us a behind the scenes fly on the wall into somebody's life to whatever extent they're willing to offer it. But with that, um, the anonymized uh, attacks that come on people who make errors or mistakes or people who don't, uh, you know, profiles who people don't like is just destroying the entire space and the people involved in it. And I think it's, you know, if, if I look at recent examples with sports people making errors that may cost their team a game or whatever it might be, and they are absolutely lambasted by people to a level that whereby, where's the perspective? Where is the, the understanding that these are the best of the best people who, who you are talking to as if, and some of the stuff that comes out is just so offensive. So I actually, I, I know there was a, a bit of a movement probably a couple of months ago, was it? Um, Marcus, Ra Marcus Rashford being right at the center of it, yep. whereby I know there was, a, there was a, a government, there was a poll for people to, for the profile no longer being something that you could have as an ano anonymous profile and that you, it would have to be linked to I don't know, national insurance number or passport number, or driver's license or whatever, because and that, that's how far it's gone. And I think that has to be the next step within the space because social media has so much to offer people and it's growing all the time. And you get, you know, I guess if, if it's used well, it can be fantastic. My concern is the, the overuse of it now, um, you know, the reliance on it and the, the, the mental health issues that are caused through it. Um, right through the scale from really young people to really old people um, from high profile to Joe blogs. I think the, the mental health risks are there. And I think if people don't manage those properly, then th th there could be problems. Yep. And uh, I think you're right on the right track there with some sort of KYC to, mm. to set up a profile. I think so the logical step without wanting to police it and remove freedom of yeah. speech and everything else. Yeah. Rory, what's next in uh, the next chapter and where you're going? What's, uh, what's Rory going to be doing in the next one, two, three, five, ten 10 years? Well, um, I, you know, I, I, I have a few, I have a few things within my portfolio that I do and um, I'm not looking to, to expand on that too much, but you just, you never know what, what might come along, but for me, I've, I've found a uh, new purpose and energy and uh, enjoyment from having a leadership role within a, a business of leadership. And that's on a one-on-one -on -one with my exec coaching and um, with one-on-ones and groups with the leadership work. Um, I thoroughly enjoy that. And, you know, I, when, I, when I met Don Leddingham, the CEO, his, his vision was to, to change the world through wise leadership. And bit by bit it's, it's trying to continue to 
to do that with the people that I um, that I work with, and that that's where my focus is is on, you know really developing the people I work with. Um, elsewhere, uh, the broadcasting work I, I thoroughly enjoy and, and would like to continue to do that. And my my role with uh, the charity and the the barbarians is is there as well. So. Yeah, it's, it's just, it's trying to continue to get better at what I currently do and then prepare for life with two kids uh, <laughs> and, uh, and and try to get myself in as good a position for that as possible and then, you know, ride that wave when it comes. So, yeah, it's um, it's just a kind of mindset approach. I think, John, it's, I, my wife, India, questions me at times whether I take on too much. Sometimes I do, but I think I'm getting closer to getting the balance right and um, I think I, 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 I believe in myself and believe I have a skill set to the level that I can put my mind to whatever I'm doing and try and make a success of it. So yep. yeah, it's, um, it's, on, it's on to the next day. That's the, the challenge. That's it. So uh, a wise old person once told me is that if you want something done, give it to a busy person. <laughs> so uh, Indeed. Rory, it's been an absolute pleasure having uh, the time's just flying, flown past. So it's been an absolute pleasure having you on the show and I'm sure people watching will get uh, some great value from uh, some of the insights and, uh, and thoughts that you've shared with us. Uh, thank you very, very much on behalf of uh, everybody watching uh, for your time and participation. Brilliant. Thanks for having me, John.